look in John chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 19, and we're going to see the witness of John the Baptist. And from this story, we're going to pull out a few ideas on how we can be a good witness for Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is this. Are you ready? Write this down. A good witness finds his identity in Jesus. A good witness finds his identity in Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. Are you there? John chapter 1, verse 19. This was John's testimony. This was his witness. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? Now remember, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness, and he was preaching, and he was baptizing. And all of Judea, all of Jerusalem, the Bible says, all of the Jews were going out there to hear him preach. And I just thought about this. John the Baptist did not set up a church on the highway so that it would be easy for people to get there. Because these people knew that a church that's alive is worth the drive. Amen? And they were willing to go out into the wilderness to hear the Word of God. All of these people began to go. No doubt on Saturday when it was time for synagogue that the priests got up to speak and to teach God's Word. And they looked out among their congregation and there were fewer and fewer. And they said, where's Bob this week? Where's Ann this week? Where's so-and-so this week? Oh, they went out to see the baptizer. They went out to the Baptist church. They, they, they went out there to hear some fiery, stomping, spitting, hollering, preaching out there is what they went to hear. And so they saw all of their folks going out there to hear John the Baptist. And they said, you know what? We may ought to look into this. And so we see from Jerusalem, these scribes and these priests, these priests and Levites, it says, went out there to investigate John the Baptist and his ministry. Later, we're going to find it was the Pharisees that sent them. The Pharisees were the aristocratic uh, class of people. They were the religious leaders uh, that were the, the top of the food chain in Judaism of that day. And they sent out the priests and Levites who were kind of their minions to go and to talk to John the Baptist. But notice the question they asked was, who are you? This was a question of identity. You're somebody special, no doubt, but who are you? Now, in verse 20, John replies. It says, He did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. The word Messiah in Old Testament is Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. In the New Testament, the Greek word for Messiah is Christos. So when you hear Jesus Christ, that's not his last name. That is Jesus, the Messiah. And so in this text, he knew what they were thinking when they asked the question. And he is answering the question behind the question because they were wondering, are you claiming to be the Messiah? And he says, I am not. The Messiah was the anointed one who was anointed for a particular purpose and a particular reason. In the Old Testament, you had people that were anointed to serve the Lord. You had priests who were anointed. You had kings who were anointed. You had prophets who were anointed. But there was one anointed one in the Old Testament who was the Messiah who was going to usher in the kingdom of God. And he says, I am not that person. They go on to ask, what then, in verse 21, are you Elijah? Now, why would they ask that question? Elijah was an Old Testament prophet. In 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says that he did not die, but he, he was taken up to God in a whirlwind, accompanied by the chariots of fire. 
If you've not read that passage of Scripture, I'd encourage you to do so. It's a pretty fun one. I wouldn't have mind being there to see that take place. But in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, the Bible says, Look, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Before this end time, before the Lord shows up, I'm going to send Elijah. Now, John the Baptist says, I am not, in verse 21. Jesus says that he was Elijah who was to come. Well, who is right? Both of them are right. He was not the literal Elijah, but he was the figurative, metaphorical Elijah who was coming before the Lord was going to show up. So in one sense, John was right. He was not the literal Elijah. In another sense, Jesus was right because he was the figurative fulfillment of that prophecy. And so we see here, he says, I'm not Elijah. Notice the Messiah and Elijah were both in time apocalyptic figures who were going to show up when the end was near. These were people that the Jews were looking for because they were looking for when God was going to return and return the glory of Israel. There was another person that was connected to these end times. That's known as the prophet. Look there, verse 21. Are you the prophet? And he answers, no. In Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18, here's what it says. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. This is what you requested from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not continue to hear the voice of the Lord our God and see the great fire any longer so that we will not die. Then the Lord said, They have spoken well. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. Now there were a number of prophets in the Old Testament but there was the prophet for whom they were looking who was going to show up and was going to fulfill that in time. John said, I'm not him either. Then verse 22, who are you then? They asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? Verse 23, here's his answer. He said, I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. So he goes back and he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, and he says, this is who I am. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 40. Let me give, read to you verse 3 through 5. A voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In Isaiah 40, he is promising the end time fulfillment of God's appearance. And in that time when the Lord shows up, he would right every wrong. He would bring wrath and justice to those who had sinned, and he would bring blessing to those who were faithful. In that day, all of Israel was looking forward to that day, and he says that before the Lord shows up, he would send not a man, not a preacher, not a priest, not a king, not somebody. In fact, it says a what? Voice. This person was so insignificant that all you would remember was his voice. And the purpose behind this person was to announce the coming of the Lord. He was to make way, to make the path level and straight for the Lord to show up. My friends... You do not have to get people's attention on you before they turn it to Jesus. You find your value. You find your strength. You find your identity, and our church finds its identity not in being the first Baptist church of Lafayette, but in being the church of Jesus Christ. 
He sets our identity. Number two, a good witness finds his credibility in Jesus. A good witness finds his credibility in Jesus. Notice in verse 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and so they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet. Now, why are they asking this question? Uh, it, they were, it was not foreign to them, this idea of baptism. In Judaism of this day, whenever there was a proselyte, there was a Gentile or a pagan who decided that they wanted to become a Jew, they wanted to follow the God of Judaism, follow the Old Testament, Mosaic Law, etc., they would proselyte, they would become a convert or a proselyte to Judaism, and what they would do is that the men, the males, would be circumcised, and then all of them would be baptized. In fact, there were baptistries all around the temple complex at the time of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 2, when 3,000 people are saved and baptized that day, they already had the baptistry set up for those baptisms. And so they were not foreign to, to the idea of baptism. However, John the Baptist was doing something a little different. He was not baptizing non-Jews who were becoming Jews. He, were, he was baptizing Jews that didn't need to be baptized, at least in the mind of the spiritual leaders of the day. And so he was baptizing, and he was doing it in a way that was outside the confines of what Judaism had been teaching, and they were asking him, on what authority are you baptizing people? On what authority are you out here preaching? On what authority are you out here doing this? They were questioning his credibility of his witness. Notice his answer, he says, verse 26, I baptize with water. Now, this is actually a shortened amount of what he actually said. So I want to read Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so he was baptizing in water, but Jesus was going to show up and baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, he doesn't talk about Holy Spirit and fire here because his emphasis here was not the way or in what he was baptizing. The emphasis was his credibility. The emphasis was placed on his authority, and so he immediately goes to Jesus. Look what he says. He says, he answered them, Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. household slaves in that day did a number of things for the homeowner and the master. One thing that household slaves did not do because it was too demeaning was unstrap the straps of the master's sandal. John the Baptist, who was gathering massive crowds of people, he was preaching to massive groups baptizing, uh, so much so that it got the Jewish people's attention all the way in Jerusalem. I mean, he was having as much success as you can have. In fact, Jesus said there's no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. Yet John the Baptist said, I am not worthy to untie his sandals. That is how amazing Jesus is. When they asked, on what authority do you speak? He said, I'm speaking on the authority of the one who is to come. We think that we have to earn the right to share the good news of Jesus with someone by serving them or loving them 
or having a relationship with them. We think that we have to earn the right by living a good life. We think that we have to earn the right. And many of us think that we are not worthy to tell people about Jesus Christ because of our past life. But my friends, listen to what I'm about to tell you. You have the authority to be a witness. Your witness is true and it is credible, not because of you, but because of the one to whom you're witnessing. The one about whom you're witnessing. We have the greatest news the world can ever know. My friends, I do not care who the messenger is. If you give me great news, it's good day. Amen? It does not matter who you used to be. You can be, could have been a a scallywag before Jesus. I do not care what your BC days look like. The Apostle Paul's name was Saul. He was a murderer persecuted the church, yet one of the greatest heralds of the gospel that ever lived. I do not care who you were. It is because of Jesus that you now have the credibility to tell people the good news. Then we see a good witness. He finds his identity, finds his credibility, and last, a good witness finds his felicity in Jesus. The word felicity means joy. Look in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water in water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him, and I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit is descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I have seen testified that this is the Son of God. Jesus was approaching. This was not the idea that he came in a formal way to John the Baptist, but he came by that day. He approached, and John the Baptist saw him walking by and recognized him. And how did John the Baptist recognize him? Well, because, and we see that this is not the first time that John the Baptist had encountered Jesus. Now, remember, they were relatives, right? Their moms knew each other. I have no doubt that they knew each other from childhood, but I'm not sure that John the Baptist knew that Jesus was Jesus at that point. And so God gave him, notice it says, let me, let's look back in the section, let me show you this. It says in verse 33, he who sent me to baptize. Who was that? Who sent him to baptize? God did. When God called him, he said, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptized in the Holy Spirit. He is the one for whom you are clearing the way. He is the one from from whom you get your credibility. He is the one to whom you are looking. And so there was an episode, we see it in another gospel, where Jesus comes and he gets baptized. And when he comes up out of the water, it says the Spirit as a dove comes down and he lighted on Jesus. Remember, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, right? He spoke from heaven. And John the Baptist saw that and he recognized this is he. And then he left that day and then he comes back this day and they're all listening and he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, this Lamb of God, we we think that that means a number of things. We immediately go back to other things in the Old Testament. Did you know there's no statement calling any title the Lamb of God except in this chapter? We have God, we have Lamb, we have the Lamb. There are lambs used in the Old Testament. There are lambs in the New Testament. It's hard to really nail down exactly, is this the Passover Lamb? Well, it could be, except the Passover Lamb did not take away the sins of the world. Well, was this the the lamb that God provided when Abraham was sacrificing Isaac? It may have been. However, when God was sacrificing Isaac, that lamb that was provided was a a ram with his horns caught in uh, in the tree. So that may not have been it. 
uh, well, it was it the sacrificial lamb, maybe the scapegoat. So on, the, on Yom Kippur, they would take an animal, sacrifice, they would take a goat, they would put the sin on the goat and send it out into the wilderness, and it symbolized God taking the sin and removing it. Well, that wasn't a lamb, it wasn't a scape lamb, was it? It was a scape goat that was sent out. So there's nothing in the Old Testament that perfectly applies specifically to the Lamb of God. We do see in the book of Revelation, we see the Lamb, do we not? And when we see the Lamb, we see the Lamb coming to take away the sins of the world, not through forgiveness, but through His wrath. Well, which one is it? What are we looking at? Well, let me boil it down to this. When he talks about Jesus as the Lamb of God, it is sacrificial in nature, it is substitutionary in nature to where he took our place, and it is salvific in nature. When he says the Lamb of God, he is saying, this is the way that you can be saved. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He says Jesus is the one going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. He is the one that's going to show up, and he's going to fill us with the Spirit of God that we might know him and have a relationship with him. And then lastly, he says he is the Son of God. When he says he's the Son of God, he is encapsulating all of the prophecies about Jesus. He is saying he is divine. He is saying that he's God's Messiah. He is saying that he is God's salvation. Everything is wrapped up in this idea of the Son of God. John coins these phrases here in, uh, when he speaks. John the Baptist does. Now what does this do? Listen to John chapter 3. 27 through 30. John responded, No one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who is the bride is the, he who's with the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. How do you think John presented Jesus? Do you think he did it like this? There's John preaching, and everybody's around. He looks up and he sees Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. I know it's him because I saw the Spirit come down. And it was really cool. The Son of God. Let's pray. You think that's how he did it? I don't think he sounded like Eeyore whenever Jesus showed up. I have a feeling that he was sitting there preaching. Boy, he had his notes out. He had his Bible out. And he was rocking along. All of a sudden, he saw Jesus. He went, oh, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. I saw him. I know him. I saw the Spirit come down. It's the Son of God. It, it probably was like that, what you think? The whole reason for John the Baptist's existence was to introduce people to Jesus. It was not to grow a big church. It was not to get a big name. It was not to make a lot of money. John the Baptist's purpose was to introduce people to Jesus. And when people met Jesus, John the Baptist had the greatest joy, felicity in his life. Do you know, there are a number of things that I do in ministry that bring me joy. But there is nothing that brings me joy than when someone comes to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Can I tell you the greatest joy you can ever experience as a follower of Christ is not an awesome song from the choir and orchestra. No offense. It's great. We love it. 
but that's not the greatest joy. It is not a rousing gospel message from the preacher that's the greatest joy. It's not even having a class social where you eat a lot of king cake. The greatest joy is when you are part of someone coming to know Jesus. Why is it that we are not good witnesses? It's because we don't really care if they come to Jesus or not. What drives me to share the gospel is the joy of seeing people saved. But if I don't care about that joy and about that soul and about God being glorified, if I don't care about that, then I am not going to witness because it's not a big deal to me. All of the excuses, all of the reasons that we can't witness, well, I don't know enough or I can't do it, all of the fear, all of that melts away when we remember the joy of seeing somebody saved. The joy of that newborn baby causes the mother to forget all of the pain of carrying that child. At least that's what they tell me. And the joy of sharing the gospel and seeing someone saved outweighs all of the fear and all of the difficulty and all of the excuses that we have. So the issue with being a witness is that we are more focused on ourselves than we are on Jesus. The reason John the Baptist was successful is because when they showed up and asked his identity, all he could say was Jesus. When they showed up and asked for his credibility, all they could say was Jesus. When he showed his felicity, what brought him joy, all he could say was Jesus. My friends, you want to be prepared to be a witness? Start by looking to Jesus. Would you like someone to pray with you about a need in your life? Or perhaps you'd like to join us in praying for needs in our community and around the world. We have a prayer page on our website at fbclaf.org. pray There you can submit prayer requests and you can also pray for the request of others. Visit our prayer page at fbclaf.org. pray